Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Tech Exceptions. And today we have an exceptional conversation, an exceptional story about a startup that actually started in academia research and turned into a real startup with open source and everything around it. So please welcome my special guest, Annette Binusa. Annette Binusa is the co-founder of Concordant. Hi, Annette. Hi, Eddie. It's great to be here. Great to have you with us. So. How does it work? I mean, what is the career path that you took to, to reach the stage that you say, hey, you know, I have this great research. I can take it and make it into a business. Uh, so actually, my career started uh, in a uh, not very straight line. So I actually um, started uh, studying math and Latin after I finished high school. And even though I sold my first software in high school as a high school student, I always thought computers are not for me because, you know, you sit in front of a... Uh, screen all day and just type away and it's not very interactive and so on but um, eventually I ended up um, doing computer science and yeah I have a great team now that uh, is doing tremendous uh, work and very interesting research and um, out of two European research projects um, Sungfri and Lightcon we actually decided eventually that uh, we want to bring the technology we were developing there to the market and this is how we ended up doing the startup yeah yeah so basically taking it all the way from just writing papers and you know talking at conferences and presenting posters to actually saying hey it can be applicable in real life and people can use it in in the business and and today and we actually going our talk today is about crdts which is you know heavy topic in research, sometimes it's hard for people to understand what it even means. So maybe you can help us understand what are CRDTs and why are they so important for edge applications today? Yeah, so CRDTs are a um, data model that helps synchronizing data between different devices. These devices can be edge devices like um, user mobile, users using mobile phones, uh, but also IoT-based um, uh, yeah, recordings and um, edge devices. Um, and what we are doing is we are replicating the data um, all the way from the edge um, to the cloud and back. And CRDTs are very great because they allow us to not only replicate immutable data, but also support mutable data. So for example, application state that can be found uh, in games and collaborative editors, um, and uh, yeah, where, where changes happen all the time. And typically it's quite difficult to keep these uh, data items uh, in sync because uh, when there are two uh, different modifications happening concurrently, um, we don't want to block users from modifying the data, but um, the application should just work smoothly, um, no matter how many people are editing the same document, for example. Um, and what CRDTs do is kind of in the background, uh, reconcile the um, conflicting, potentially conflicting updates and um, providing a unified, uh, consistent um, view of the data of the application state to the programmer and to the user. Hmm. And you mentioned games. How exactly that works with games that we know today? Uh, so today uh, what we see is that uh, very often we have uh, limitations that are due to the way our um, current infrastructure typically works. So for example, if I have a mobile game and you're kind of standing right next to me, but we're in the middle of a forest and we cannot connect our um, yeah, game playing via some um, uh, network um, technology, um, then we are kind of stuck, right? Um, so what, what we are trying to do is um, enable um, horizontal, um, horizontal data sharing um, that uh, helps keeping yeah, game state uh, with people that are um, close by, so really physically close by, but then also synchronize the state back to the cloud, um, such that uh, more persistent um, information is uh, yeah, made available, and um, also cloud-based um, analytics and data processing is enabled. Hmm. So if I'll take a step back and I want to think about this data that I that I have and actually this game more specifically. So I'm playing and let's say I'm playing with my phone in the middle of the forest. I definitely don't have internet connection or anything of such. And I'm playing with my friend who also playing in the forest. Um, how do we how, how are applications communicate and, and what can we do with that? What kind of game we can build with that? So we can 
build games that have true collaboration, um, no matter what the environment is kind of offering you. I could try to connect my mo mobile phone directly with yours using local LAN or using Bluetooth. Um, and uh, this way we can play, even though we are currently for some time uh, disconnected from the outside world. As soon as we were back in the city, um, our phones could then synchronize their state with the cloud servers that um, then are enabled to do analytics on the data and um, yeah, provide persistence of the data. Right now, um, you typically need to go all the way from the edge to the cloud and back in order to synchronize data. And this is a long way. Um, so with the, we, we hope that also with the um, advent of better edge networks like 5G uh, and things like that, um, or micro um, data centers that are deployed in um, buildings like office buildings, um, that we can simplify the yeah, data exchange between users and make this more smooth. Interesting. So if I can simplify the data extension, and I actually don't need to go all the way to the cloud sometimes, just you know, once in a while I can say, okay, I'm syncing my information with the cloud, but I can actually collaborate between my friends or my colleagues or you know, at school or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for me. What, so I have games, what will be an, a next scenario that, that, you, that I can do to, um, that I can leverage this specific technology for? Uh, so other scenarios that we can see is um, if we have collaborative uh, applications um, like um, text editors, so CRDTs are known to be a very um, powerful technology that um, actually powers a lot of text editors that are out there. And um, similarly to the text editors, we can, with the general CRDT technology and um, other data types, also synchronize um, arbitrary application state. So this could be, for example, a phone book that you're sharing with your colleagues that are residing in the same office, um, but also actually with yourself on different devices. Yeah, so this also enables um, data sharing across different devices for the same user, of course. So it's all about um, data replication, which is both good for fault tolerance, uh, as we all know, um, and also for availability. Yeah. Um, other scenarios that we have in mind uh, where, this, where this actually could work very well, we believe, is classrooms. So right now, currently, um, some infrastructure um, has become available to run uh, cloud-based um, uh, classroom applications where students synchronize their um, yeah, uh, digital or electronic um, books uh, or uh, folders uh, with uh, teachers and um, but not very often also with classmates because uh, these things are typically split between the students. And uh, we hope, for example, uh, that our technology enables um, applications that allow students to work on their own notebook together with the person that is sitting right next uh, in the classroom, but potentially also when they're back home doing the homework or are quarantined um, and have only limited access to the, to the classroom uh, resource itself. Yeah, that's... That's great, especially now that we know more and more people are using their different connected devices. It can be a tablet, it can be a phone, it can be a laptop, a computer, and we kind of want to sync everything together, but not necessarily all the time we want to go to the cloud or we have an internet, a stable internet connection for syncing all these devices. Uh, so this can be you know, a great technology to use for syncing our home devices or class devices or any of the devices we already have. Yeah. Uh, so I really like that that approach. Um, and now, right now with, with the company, what, what exactly uh, do you do and what's your next steps? Um, so currently we're really deep in the development of the platform. What we want to do for programmers is give them a um, pretty um, straightforward interface to use such that they don't actually need to worry about the data synchronization themselves, but really just are able to program against a well-defined uh, interface that also enables them to um, provide a strong invariance for their applications such that they, um, for example, um, yeah, can, can program against a um, consistent snapshot of the data and the platform makes sure that this consistent snapshot becomes consistently available on other devices. So we are making progress uh, for this at the moment and we hope to open source our first modules uh, in the upcoming weeks. Um, but we're also now looking for um, good use cases, partners and applications that help us move forward. So um, 
if uh, some of the listeners um, are interested, uh, it would be wonderful if you would get in touch and uh, share your ideas with us. Yeah, sounds great. I really like your approach with going open source and saying, hey, you know, this is what we're building. This is what we're working on. Take a look and see what we're doing. By the way, which programming language do you use uh, for the open source? Oh, we use a mixture. So um, since we believe that uh, quite a bit of our applications will be web-based, um, we, we are building part of the libraries uh, in TypeScript. Um, part of this will also be done or is done in uh, Kotlin because this allows us to uh, cross-compile between the different platforms and eventually also um, yeah, uh, allows us to um, have uh, native applications running on edge devices. That's really cool. It's really good to hear this uh, decisions. It's always, I think it's always a challenge, especially in the technical part when it starts, like which programming languages should we go with? They're the programming language that are, you know, sometimes it's easier to find people that already know them or it connects well to the different frameworks and platforms that we want to work with. But sometimes it's not from performance wise, it's not always the best one. So there's like a trade off of, you know, the languages that we pick. Uh, usually when, when we start something, uh, uh, something like a business or an open source. Um, so what was the criteria for you when you said, hey, I want to work with these specific programming languages? Um, well, we needed to find um, developers that are um, able to yeah, push, the, push the development in a language that they feel comfortable with. And of course, um, it's a question what the, what the market kind of uh, dictates, right? If, if you do web, then I guess uh, you actually currently at least um, uh, have to stick with some form of uh, JavaScript. Um, I'm more of a strongly typed person, so um, this is where the, where the TypeScript kind of came in. But yeah, um, it's yeah. Sometimes you're limited in choice. Uh, for my research, I really like using uh, Erlang because it's a, a programming language that really shines when it comes to distributed programming. But it has some quirks, and it's unfortunately not as widespread as I as I would hope. But yeah, let's see where the future is uh, bringing us. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's see what the future bringing us. I know Erlang is a, a lot of people use Erlang, uh, especially uh, when they build different messaging systems uh, and in that space. But it does has um, a steep learning curve to start with. Now, it's not it's not easy for people to to get their hands on, especially if the, that's that's their first programming language. So Kotlin and TypeScript uh, are often uh, much easier for people to to get started and and get their hands on. All right, cool. So um, how do you see uh, your company uh, next moves after you find a partnership and more people will join? Um, yeah, so I hope that uh, we have a, have a kind of organic growth. So we want to build something that is sustainable. Um, and uh, yeah, the more interesting use cases we have, uh, the more this will help us um, shape our um, own platform. So. Um, we try to cover the, the whole spectrum, but from from cloud to um, yeah uh, devices, kind of in, in the in the in the middle part of the of the networking, um, down to the uh, down to the edge devices, and um, depending on where um, business interest is, I believe it might be also interesting for us to develop uh, custom um, edge boxes uh, that power then um, our application platform at the place where it's actually used. So this, this might, might be something I would, I would love to see. Cool. All right. Annette, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing what you're building. And I'm definitely looking forward for the day you published it open source and I can finally take a look at it and try it myself and try to play it and tweak it and see uh, what we can do with it. Thank you, Ari. All right, see you soon. Bye, take care.